in this video, we'll be talking about glial cells. And this is a high yield video for USMLE step one, or even if you are a normal uh, biology student or a medical student, this video would be very useful for you. So when we think about our brain, neurons are not the only cell type. There are astrocytes, there are microglia, oligodendrocytes. So all of these are actually glial cell types. Each of these glial cell type talk to each other and they also communicate with the neurons. And this intricate communication is important for the normal brain function. Apart from regulating brain function, these glial cells has distinct roles in the central and the peripheral nervous system. In this video, we would try to understand that. So glial cells can be found in both CNS or, or PNS. So in CNS, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia, and ependymal cells are the key glial cell types. In peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells and satellite cells are the key glial cell types. In this video, we'll be talking about first astrocytes and stellet cells. Then we'll be talking about Schwann cells and oligodendrocyte. Third, we'll talk about microglia and its role in neuroinflammation. And finally, we'll be talking about ependymal cells. So this video would be slightly long, but if you stay tuned till the end of this video, you would have a detailed description about all these glial cell type and a current update about the research ongoing on these topics. So first, we'll talk about astrocytes. So astrocytes are important glial cell type in the brain which forms blood brain barrier. Let's talk about the astrogenesis. That means how astrocytes are born. Astrocytes are born from radial glial progenitor. In the brain, radial glial progenitor give rise to one radial glia and neurons in the first few, uh, in the first order of the timeline. Eventually, these as the time progress, this particular radial glial cell type eventually give rise to astrocytes. So obviously, there are common progenitors for neuron and glia in the brain. Let's talk about the functions of astrocytes. There are two key functions of astrocyte. First, astrocyte participates in the synapse formation. Astrocytes along with neuron forms the tripartite synapse. Astrocytes also touch the blood vessel and it forms the blood brain barrier. So it's kind of like a checkpoint in terms of nutrient uptake from the brain, from the blood to the brain. And also it prevents harmful pathogens to enter the brain. Astrocytes regulate the glutamate glutamine cycle inside the neuron. So obviously they regulate and modulate synaptic function. Glutamate is the key neurotransmitter in our nervous system. And there are many, many neurons which are glutamatergic neurons. And astrocyte regulates these glutamatergic synaptic transmission. So this is a presynapse and a postsynapse. And in pink, you can see the astrocyte. So in, when the presynaptic action potential reach its terminal, it lead to glutamate release in the synapse. Postsynaptic glutamate receptors would uh, bind to glutamate and it would lead to um, the postsynaptic response. So glutamate is generated by glutamine with the help of enzyme glutaminase in the presynaptic terminal. Now, where does glutamine come from? It turns out glutamine is provided by the astrocytes. But how does astrocyte get the glutamine? So when glutamate is released in the synaptic cliff, it doesn't persist there for long. So astrocyte actually uptakes glutamate with the help of excitatory amino acid transporters and convert that glutamate into glutamine with the help of glutamine synthetase. And this glutamine is channeled back to the neuron which can be used to synthesize the glutamate. But what is the benefit of this sort of uh, glutamate glutamine cycle? Because too much glutamate is bad for the neuron. If there is too much glutamate, there is risk of excitotoxicity. And neurons might die out of these excitotoxicity. These sort of problems happen in epilepsy and many other neurological disorder. So excess amount of glutamate which is present in the synaptic cleft is actually uptaken by the astrocyte. Thereby, astrocyte plays a protective role when it comes to the neuronal functionality. Now, astrocyte also secrete several molecules which are known as gliotransmitter. These gliotransmitters not only participate 
in neuronal activity modulation, but they have other messenger roles as well. So first, astrocytes participate in synaptic communication and they are vital, vital part of this tripartite synapse. So these gliotransmitters are recepted by specific uh, receptors present on pre and the post synapse and thereby neuronal activity can be modulated via the astrocytes as well. So these are latest updates from the research side. Now let's talk about the blood-brain barrier. So any harmful substance that is present in our blood does not reach the brain thanks to this blood-brain barrier. So this blood-brain barrier is actually capillary endothelial cells of the blood vessels and the astrocytes, which limits the uh, molecular movement across the blood to the brain. So let's say there are harmful pathogens or metabolites. It doesn't enter the brain directly because this barrier prevents it. So these are, this barrier is composed of capillary endothelial cell, astrocytic end fits, pericytes, and the tight junctions between the capillary endothelial cell is really important. It allows the diffusion of essential molecules like oxygen, carbon dioxide, hormones, and some small polar, non-polar molecules. But it also limits the um, passage of several other molecules as well. There are transporters such as glucose transporters, which help in glucose uptake in the brain. But there, there are these selectivity filters, these tight junctions prevent harmful bacteria or pathogen to enter the brain, thereby protecting the brain from these kind of harmful effects. So... Overall, blood-brain barrier is insulating the brain from damage due to the peripheral immune events. Obviously, immune cells cannot invade the brain very frequently because there is a blood-brain barrier. Also, the cytokines cannot reach the brain rampantly because there is a blood-brain barrier. Thereby, astrocytic enfits and astrocytes are really important in that context. Now, once we think about astrocyte, we think they are a homogeneous population, but it's not true. Astrocytes are highly heterogeneous and thanks to our latest technology, which give us this kind of outlook. So with single cell RNA sequencing from human and mouse brain, now it is pretty clear that there are different subtypes and subclasses of astrocytes. And each of these subclasses are present in different proportion in different brain regions. That leads us to the astrocytic diversity in the brain. Still scientists are baffled by the correlation between the diversity and functional specification of the astrocytes and how they regulate the overall brain function. Now let's talk about astrocyte states. Like you are angry sometimes and you are sometimes chilled, astrocytes also have ground state and reactive state. So reactive states when they are super angry or they become pathogenic, they, they start damaging the brain. So these reactive astrocytes are implicated in many diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. So in Alzheimer's disease, it turns out that astrocytes can interact with microglia and can eventually make the things worse. So when there are plaque formation in the uh, overall brain in the Alzheimer's patient, this can be uptaken by the microglia. Microglia secretes several inflammatory cytokines, which turns astrocyte into reactive astrocytes. And then reactive astrocytes starts modulating the neuronal activity as we have seen earlier. Thus, a vicious, vicious cycle is created which damage the brain in case of AD patients. Reactive astrocytes are also implicated in Huntington disease and amyotropic lateral sclerosis. So reactive astrocyte these days is a common theme and people think that this is the driver for many disease progression, including neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental disorders. So here is a quick summary about the astrocyte. We talked about the function, especially the synaptic function, the blood-brain barrier, the neurological disorder context etc you can take a screenshot at this point now let's talk about the satellite cells we are talking about satellite cells because they live in the peripheral nervous system remember astrocytes were all only present in the central nervous system now still it's satellite cells are a glial cell type which are enriched in the peripheral nervous system specifically they are found in sensory and autonomic ganglia which are cluster of nerve cell bodies outside the central nervous system so they are closely associated with the cell body of these neurons but what they are doing what is the function of these cells so they regulate micro environment near the neurons they provide structural support and respond to injury they contribute to immune and repair processes also satellite cells are of the peripheral nervous system isolate the neuron cell bodies without uh, i mean within the sensory autonomic ganglia now let's talk about oligodendrocytes 
Oligodendrocytes are other type of glial cells that are present in the central nervous system. Oligodendrocytes are playing key role in myelinating axons. Myelinating axons is super important because when the myelination is not there, conduction is slow. So myelination acts like an insulation which increases the speed of nerve uh, conduction. So speed and saltatory conduction is only possible thanks to these my myelinating cells. Also, the efficiency of the uh, transmission of neuronal signals in, is enhanced when there is myelination. So overall, oligodendrocyte plays an important role in context of myelinating the axons. Now, oligodendrocyte, one oligodendrocyte can myelinate several uh, axons. So this is very peculiar. Also, uh, they extend their processes and can reach to several neurons spaced apart. So here is a quick comparison between oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells. Schwann cells are present in the peripheral nervous system and Schwann cells can basically uh, reach, one Schwann cell can reach only one axon. Now let's talk about a quick uh, embryonic timeline where we can see gliogenesis is happening. When it comes to oligodendrocyte, the uh, oligodendrocyte genesis is happening somewhere at embryonic, uh, day, embryonic week uh, 10 to the postnatal period. Now gestational timeline has uh, differences because oligodendrocytes are not born in a mature state. They were first uh, designated as oligodendrocyte progenitors which occurs at gestational week 10 to 18. Then what happens they become immature oligodendrocytes which happens at 18 to 28 gestational week. Eventually they become a uh, mature oligodendrocyte which happens at 28 to 40 uh, gestational week. So each of these stages of oligodendrocyte maturation can be distinguished by specific molecular markers as described here. Also it's important to note that oligodendrocyte progenitors are self has the self renewal capacity. Now it's important to note that others, uh, other cell types such as astrocytes are generated from the neuronal uh, stem cells and also oligodendrocytes are generated from the neuronal stem cells itself. So the key essence is the external and in the internal signal which tells the neuronal stem cells when to make neuron, when to make astrocytes and when to make oligodendrocytes. Isn't it fascinating? Now oligodendrocytes are highly implicated in the context of multiple, multiple sclerosis which is a progressive destruction of the myelin sheath surrounding the axon. This lead to plethora of neuronal or neurologic symptoms. So obviously there are specific proteins present in the oligodendrocyte or, or in the myelin sheath such as myelin basic protein, proteolipid protein and myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein. All of these are native to oligodendrocyte. They are not supposed to be treated as foreign by the immune system. But in multiple sclerosis, these proteins are treated as foreign. T cells get activated against these particular antigens and they are autoreactive T cells which cause problem. They activate B cells, eventually that gets converted into plasma cells which secretes antibody and this damage the myelin sheet by specific antibody mediated complement fi fixation thereby myelin sheet is progressively destroyed in multiple sclerosis which creates severe inflammation in the brain not only that these sort of t cells get converted into specific subtypes like th1 and th17 both of these subtypes are pro-inflammatory pro that means they have strong capability of evoking inflammation in the brain that explains how oligodendrocytes protect our nervous system and how that is damaged in multiple sclerosis. Now there are, this is a healthy brain and this is how a multiple sclerosis brain look like. There are several cortical demyelination, white matter demyelination, which is pretty evident. And this happens due to the defect in the myelin sheath. Now let's talk about Schwann cells. When we talk about Schwann cells, we deviate our focus from CNS to the PNS because they are present only in the peripheral nervous system, not in the CNS. They were first named by the German physicist Theodor Schwann in 19th century. So these Schwann cells are present in vertebrate PNS and one Schwann cell can myelinate only one axon. In contrast, oligodendrocyte can myelinate multiple axons. Schwann cells are neural crest cell derivative. During the early nervous system development, neural crest cells migrate and they enter the 
peripheral nervous system where they can eventually attach with these axons. So initially there are immature or swan cell precursors which becomes immature swan cells and ultimately they wraps around the axon several times creating this particular uh, myelin sheet. So there are initial axonal interaction, later on there is strong basal lamina interactions which uh, hel help to insulate the axons. Now we'll talk about the quick, uh, now, now I'll, I'll remind you that oligodendrocytes doesn't come from the neural crest cells. Oligodendrocyte and the Schwann cells has similar kind of activity, but they come from neuronal stem cells which can eventually give rise to oligodendrocyte neuron or astrocytes. So their origins are widely different. Just to summarize and compare and contrast these two cell types, oligodendrocytes are present in CNS, Schwann cells are in PNS. Oligodendrocytes myelinate multiple axons, Schwann cells myelinate only one axon, so there is one-to-one -one mapping. And oligodendrocyte progenitors uh, are actually neuronal precursors, whereas Schwann cell precursors are actually neural crest cells. Now let's talk about the microglia, which are immune cells inside the brain. So microglia has diverse set of function in the brain. Microglia are immune cells which are not generated in the brain. They are generated elsewhere and they migrate the brain. So obviously they are mesodermal derivatives. They are generated uh, during uh, from the primitive myeloid progenitors present in the yolk sac during the embryonic development. And they innervate the brain early in during the brain development. So if you look at this timeline, we can understand the microglia innervation happens at around gestational week 5 and it continues for a long time till the week 30. Now microglia has diverse set of function and it includes eliminating damage portion of the neurons synaptic pruning, releasing proteases and ROS, releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines, recruiting oligodendrocyte precursor cells, promoting repair of damaged axons, phagocytotic de debris or foreign pathogens, and also uh, providing a surveillance to the cellular environment nearby. So microglia is diverse in terms of its functionality. And microglia always extend and retract their processes. They are highly dynamic in terms of their morphology. So this tells us that they are like security guards. They constantly monitor the local environment and looking for potential pathogens or damaged uh, debris. So microglia can actually engulf cellular debris which might have come from our dead cell. It can also engulf damaged portion of the neurons as well. There are specific receptors present on the microglia known as pattern recognition receptor which can recognize damage associated molecular pattern or pathogen associated molecular pattern and these receptors help microglia to scavenge for these debris or pathogen. Now microglia plays crucial role in synaptic pruning. That means a synapse gets uh, weakened. So microglia is strongly associated with the dendritic spines in the central nervous system and current advancement in microscopy made it possible to track these dynamic interactions. Now microglial activation happens due to brain injury. When there is a brain injury, resting microglia gets converted into activated microglia. Activated microglia and resting microglia are very different. Act resting microglia has long, long processes which are surveilling for several uh, pathogens or debris, whereas activated microglia are more bushy and they have less processes. Activated microglia also secrete cytokines. Many of them are pro-inflammatory, which has strong implication in neuroinflammation. They also attract other new inflammatory cells or, or the cells of the immune system like T cells. So microglia triggers T cell infil infiltration in the brain. And that is the key cause of any disease. But the question is, how does microglia locate our injury site? It turns out from the injury site, ATP leaks out. And, it, and microglia possess specific receptors on them, them, which is known as purinergic receptors that can sense ATP and which helps the microglia to locate the injury site. Now again, single cell RNA sequencing has identified several subtypes of microglia. Each of these subtypes are morphologically different, their molecular markers are different, their functionality is also different. So that really allow the scientists to imagine that microglia are very diverse in terms of not only their functionality, in terms of their origin and diversity as well.
So microglia is associated with many disease including Alzheimer's disease. Many Alzheimer's risk genes are enriched in microglia, for example TREM2, MSA4, etc. That leads to the hypothesis that microglia is the driver for disease progression. Yes, it is still debatable, but it's a new avenue or new angle to think about. So again, like I said previously, that microglia and astrocytes talk to each other. In Alzheimer's brain, these plaques triggers microglia to release pro-inflammatory cytokines and converts astrocytes into reactive ones. So this creates a vicious cycle. Now also, it's important to note that in Alzheimer's brain, recent research has found there are specific microglia known as disease-associated microglia, which are generated, generated due to downregulation of the microglial checkpoint genes and upregulation of phagocytotic and lipid-associated uh, genes. But what are the fun exact function of these cell types, whether they are detrimental or beneficial, it's still unknown. Now let's talk about the fourth glial cell type in the central nervous system, which are the ependymal cells, eh, sorry, ependymal cells. And these cells are lining the brain ventricles. They have uh, nice projections protruding out from their apical side. These, these are cilia which can beat and this helps in CSF movement. So they, these cells are lining the brain ventricles which are filled up with cerebrospinal fluid. And this cerebrospinal fluid need to be circulating throughout the brain and spinal cord. These cell types ensure that these flow of CSF happen. So that is why they are very important in context of uh, cellular, uh, I mean CSF movement. So they are specialized glial cells, they are lining the brain ventricles and their key function is to circulate cerebrospinal fluid. They regulate molecular exchange and also they act as a barrier between CSF and the brain ventricles. So just to give you a summary, we talked about several glial cell types present in the CNS and the peripheral nervous system. I hope this video was useful. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. See you in next video, but please support our channel using super thanks. We create high quality medical videos which are otherwise not present anywhere in YouTube or any other media. And all these are for free. In order for us to make this kind of video, we need your support. Your small contribution is our motivation. See you in next video.